we're, we're coming to an end of our symposium and I'm just spending the last, um, I'm just going to give five minutes or so just to tell you then the outcomes of our pilot. So there's some real super evidence here already, you know, that has been presented, you know, from, from one particular school. But I want to just present to you just uh, the outcomes of our particular pilot and then we'll close and let you have some, if you have any questions for us at all, we'd be delighted. Uh, to answer them. So bear with me just for a moment. Okay, so the, it's just a few slides here. So yes, it's just to try and just recap. What, what were we trying to do? What was the aims of our, our, our research study? So we wanted to demonstrate that hope was teachable, as, you can, as you've heard already. And we wanted to assess the efficacy of this particular program. We wanted to find out if it could, uh, its ability in supporting good mental health, emotional awareness, increasing insight, developing problem solving skills, building confidence, and we wanted to see if it could actually reduce some symptoms of anxiety and depression in young people, uh, and also increase their awareness on how to seek help uh, in others in building empathy. So it was a mixed method uh, design, it was a feasibility pilot, uh, so we used pre-post evaluation. We didn't have a control group, and I just highlighted at the earlier stage of the, the talk that we didn't have any funding to do this, I had just pulled together five master students to try and, and do this to, together with me coordinating it. Um, so it's not a randomised controlled trial, okay, but we really like to, to do a randomised controlled trial with funding in the future, but we need something to, to start us off initially. We also did some focus group interviews with the young people uh, as well at the end of the programme. So we had six schools um, in the first pilot, um, 88 uh, all together and focus groups that were 50 pupils. Um, and as you can see there, there's the, the curriculum itself. So this is the actual intervention. You, you've heard Mary talking about it, heard Catherine talking about it. So I'm not going to go through that. Okay, but I'll just tell you the measures that we used. Um, we had to use different measures for primary school pupils and post-primary pupils. So the primary pu school pupils you used the Generalized Anxiety Disorder 6 scale. We also used the How I Feel scale, which is to measure emotional regulation. Um, we also then, for the post-primary pupils, we looked at the GAD again. We also looked at difficulties in emotional regulation. And this is for the older, over 12 years of age. And we also looked at measures of coping and the MAC scale, and lesson coping scale. And then we introduced the resilience scale as well. And this had several different subscales, self, family, friends, school, and community. And this is just pilot one. We did a pilot two as well. And I'll tell you about that in a minute or two. And we added a couple of measures in for that one. Uh, but the outcomes, um, just, it's just been demonstrated already, but we were actually able to show re significantly reduced, statistically significantly reduced levels of anxiety using the scale uh, that I had mentioned there. And we also so reduced negative cognitions in the first pilot. We also demonstrated statistically significant improvements in emotional regulation, emotional arousal and control. And, and the coping, uh, the subscales within the coping measure, overall coping had improved. Uh, but particularly self-care, empathy and tolerance had improved. Uh, in terms of resilience, we were able to show emotional resilience improved, emotional insight had improved significantly and confidence as well. And these were all backed up by the focus groups and I'll show you just a, a little map of the, the themes that we, what we determined there. Now there's the, the table, I'm not going to go through the table, uh, I'm just exactly what you see here is, is what's demonstrated in these particular tables. Okay. Uh, but some things that we didn't show didn't show statistical significance, and that the first pilot had ten lessons. If you can re remember us talking about, there were only ten, but we showed that rumination didn't change, school family connected, school connectedness. Now at the time, this was you know two and a half years ago, uh, that they didn't improve. But it's it was the first time we ever introduced hopeful minds to the school. So if we were to go back now to the same school, if we if we were to pick, for example, Drumrat College, who's now embraced it as a as a whole school approach you'll see probably a very different outcome. But initially in that particular one, we knew there was more work to do. Um, so we, add, we added in two more lessons through consultations with Catherine on rumination and failure, because that seemed to come out as, as particular issues for the young people. And we wanted to try and see if we could bed this in as a whole school approach. Um, pilot two, um, very quickly, I'll just tell you from 153 pupils, we took a different approach. We wanted to try and do a regression analysis this time. Uh, holding that idea that hope is an independent variable in its own right 
uh, and that it has, uh, if, if we're able to increase levels of hope um, by, scale, by a scale, that we're able to demonstrate improvements in all the other variables. So our hypothesis at the time was hope at post-test will significantly predict changes in resilience, depression, anxiety, emotional regulation and coping skills, and we used a series of multiple regressions. We controlled for things like age, gender, dual parenting, exercise uh, were, were included as controls. Uh, so with the of the nine remaining variables, we were able to show, um, and we found that as hope levels increased, so too did the levels of resilience, coping, and emotional regulation also increased. So for every one unit of hope that increased on the scale that we used, all these other uh, uh, variables improved significantly as well. So again, just as hope levels rose, levels of anxiety and depression actually reduced significantly um, too. So I don't know if anybody remembers doing it or actively does SPSS analysis and, uh, or has done it some time ago, but if you ever remember seeing a scale that everything lights up. Um, so if you can see, there's the little stars here indicate all the significant changes that occurred. So as, as we used hope as an independent variable, as it increased, everything else lit up. Um, so I, I'm not gonna uh, repeat, this, this slide is really just emphasizing again, exactly, exactly the specific uh, scores that increased and improved, uh, but they're all highlighted there. So our resulting coefficients shown uh, suggest that for every one unit increase in the hope scores corresponded to a decrease of one, uh, of one in, uh, in depression scores, an increase of 0.3 in resilience scores, and a reduction in 0.24 of anxiety scores. Continues on, it increased uh, emotional control, positive emotion, reduction in negative emotion, and it also uh, demonstrated adaptive coping mechanisms that were, were demonstrated um, through social support, uh, increases in stoicism and self-care. This was the uh, qualitative, this is, I'm not going into the themes, I don't have time, but I'm just going to show you the, the key things that the young people highlighted, and we just, I'm just showing them here. And it just confirmed, it really just highlighted just what was, already, what was already demonstrated. The themes that came out were positive thinking, self-efficacy, self-belief, goal setting, confidence, um, learning new skills, identifying and regulating their emotions, breaking down communication barriers and increasing their coping strategies and also sharing hope. Um, they believed that it was a future recommendation. They believed that it really needed to be shared to all of their other peers who come behind them and also helping others. Um, just some quotes from, from the pupils themselves. Um, all of the post-primary pupils, this is what they recommended. They recommend that primary school children, uh, and that's obviously your P6, P7 that they recommended specifically, should receive the HOPE programme, as it would show them and teach them how to deal with stress, it will show them how to cope when things are tough and it prepares you for the future as it gives you the tools to know how to cope with stress when you experience it. And that, that, that really sums up, I think, uh, exactly the kind of the outcomes we have, the evidence from the quantitative uh, study and also the qualitative uh, as well. So uh, just to conclude for me, these, these are preliminary findings. It's not, a, it's not a randomized controlled trial, but the preliminary findings are telling us that Hopeful Minds is very suitable for primary school children and, and post-primary up to the year 10. Um, we haven't tested beyond that. That's, that's all we can tell you at the minute. But this whole idea of increasing the conceptualization of hope in young minds has demonstrated improvements in coping, emotional resilience, regulation and arousal skills, it has increased confidence in problem solving, and has significantly reduced anxiety in the primary school children. Um, our regression analysis, as I just highlighted there, indicated that as hope scores increase, so too do scores for depression and anxiety decrease, which was fantastic. So really, just to finish off, uh, we hope that these are the life blocks that our young people need to prepare them for life stressors and adversities, and we want to continue with trialing this programme adapting it as we need to, improving it as we need to, but you know, getting some more robust evidence and getting some real funding you know, to do that would be superb. Um, but yes, the, the culture for, of coping is recommended. Whole school is something we have to do. It can't just be a one-off and not deliver it again, as Nigel has highlighted. It's some way, somehow, we can build it into the curriculum that it's sitting there within the timetable, that it's not just part of the form class or it's a kind of a stuck in lesson that has to be bedded right out of the curriculum. And there needs to be some more investment through national policy and making it mandatory. I think that's the key message that we're trying to get across. 
here here today really and you know investing in it. So I'll, I'll leave you with that um, conclusion and just thank you so much and it's been a long three hour symposium. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it myself. I've learned so much you know from my own colleagues here today again. It's been very moving I have to say. Um, very, very, very emotional for me to hear some of the, the actual stories from the college uh, directly was, was superb. So I just want to thank my own colleagues. We've, we're a great team and I hope we continue uh, to on this journey. I hope to try to do more of this if possible. Um, thank you, everyone. I just thought that was fabulous, so hats off, that was super. Um, has this concept of such form been brought to the attention of education? <coughs> say something about that? Well, yeah, yes. Yeah, Somebody who works in authority? Yeah. This, this okay. So we're, we're working on it. Um, I'm working very closely with our colleagues in the School of Education at Ulster. So Dr. Linda Clark, who's one of the research directors there, uh, we're really trying to see, see what we can do to introduce this. Linda's explaining to me that one of the, the um, in terms of one of the specific learning outcomes for teach for initial teacher training, uh, that's what seems to be coming down the line. I, I'm not sure she's hoping that it will that mental health will become one of the uh, important key features of the teacher training curriculum and if that happens then we will be able to really implement this right at the start and I think that's where probably where we, we could really make a real impact you know so for every new teacher that comes out uh, qualified that they will have a module um, their personal development module will contain you know quite a lot of this so we're actually piloting that at the moment as well to um, they're happy for us to redesign their 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 um, personal development module that they teach teachers at the minute. So we want to try and pilot that and see how that works, you know, for the teachers that are coming out and then demonstrate you know the, the impact of that as well. Um, so we there there's there's definitely uh, if there's a way of meeting people in the education authority, we'd be very, very happy to, to meet them. Oh, I would love to yes. do that. I really see natural. A, it's a natural fit, natural, yes. absolutely, yes. Uh, because they're connected to every school and uh, they would be superb in, in support this. Particularly the green paper that was highlighted earlier as well, you know, that they're talking about really pulling together a solid team, um, and not just from active intervention, but also, you know, delivering some of these programs and maintaining it as well. And I suppose up to now we've gone slow with it yeah. because we needed evidence. Sure. But now we have the evidence, we have a robust case now, and we're open for business to say this works. Yeah. So we will talk to anybody. We did present to the health subcommittee at Stormont yeah. and they were very, very keen on it. But because of our current situation, no policies are actually coming out until. But what I have said to people is, let's just continue to do it because while we wait for that to happen, Absolutely. we are going to lose lives and we cannot afford to just sit and wait for people to decide what they want to do. Absolutely. We're going to continue to do it. So what we've done is we've been really blessed with schools that have been proactive and said, you know what, we're not waiting, we're doing. And particularly the integrated colleges, I have to say, they have embraced it and really have, we have a model with Drumra, we have a model now with Oak Grove, so we have two colleges that can say, this is what works, and we have feedback from children who say, this is what we're looking for. So I think we've got something good to go with now, which we've been kind of holding yeah. back and waiting for. So yeah, we're going to try and pilot that as well too. We want to pilot um, the Oak Grove and Grady College there now in September, introducing the MEE uh, subject into the curriculum, which hopefully minds is part of that. Very similar to what what Nigel's already doing. Nigel wants to respond to something there. Well, <coughs> I've already made a note today that I need to go up to Oak Grove yes. and meet with Katrina and see what they're doing. Yes. Now, all I want to add to the discussion is two things. One, I think there's a disgraceful disconnect between education and health. And it's ludicrous. It's completely bonkers. And until we address that, we're not going to have complete wraparound care for our young people. The second thing I want to say is, our Amnesty, um, Amnesty International group meets every Thursday lunchtime and for years they've been campaigning for human rights across the world. They're a branch of Amnesty. This year they have embraced the need for mental health to be improved in schools. It's become somehow their cause 
and they are also saying it should be on the curriculum. Now, being the amnesty group with the young people and the vision and the determination they have, of course they wrote to Theresa May and told her this. Theresa May seems a little preoccupied. <laughs> and so she wrote to, she sent the letter to Derek Baker, who's the permanent secretary of the Department of Education, and Derek Baker wrote back to our Amnesty International group. Now, the letter has a lot of fine words in it, and I really admire Derek Baker. In my opinion, forget bringing Stormont back, just give Derek greater powers to legislate, and we'd all be better off. But the final two paragraphs of Derek's letter to our Amnesty group really got my attention. Uh, he says, due to the cross-cutting nature of mental health and emotional well-being, the department has also been working with colleagues in the Department of Health and the Public Health Agency to better understand the key issues surrounding emotional health and well-being among school-aged children and young people across Northern Ireland. This project is scoping the range of programs being delivered in schools and reviewing how practice aligns with the evidence of what works to promote emotional health and well-being. This work will inform the development of a framework for delivery of emotional health and well-being across executive departments to deliver coherent and effective support to children and young people. The scoping exercise is now complete. I don't remember being asked to take part in it, but anyway, apparently it's complete. And we are now working towards developing a draft framework with DOH and the PHA this year. I met with the, the Amnesty Group last Thursday lunchtime where they gave me the letter they'd been sent and I said, write back to him and tell him that we'll be a pilot school. So they said, right. So they're on that. Uh, I'm really intrigued that there's something going on. I'm disappointed we're not really hearing about it, but I do think there is a moment now to go to Derek Baker, who is a man of integrity and very willing to listen, and say, let's have this conversation. We heard about what you're doing, we'd love you to listen to what we are doing, and I think maybe the moment is now. It's interesting, isn't it? Can I just come to you? Yes, sure. Because uh, I've been doing a bit, I'm, I work, I, I'm uh, doing things just at the branch level here that, uh, that Karen is, is involved with. We're trying to get a policy statement for the North Atlantic branch to do some, to make representations. We had a government to make representations for too. But interestingly, the Children's Services Act actually mandates all government departments. It was passed in 2015 because of no, of no uh, government. It has never been, in a sense, rolled out, as far as I can see. Yeah. But it mandates all government departments and anybody with public funding, that schools, Department of Health, Department of Education, Public Health Agency, and any other even uh, uh, agency that, non statutory agency that gets public funds to cooperate with one another. And they have a, they have a well-being in the act. There's this well-being framework. I mean, it, it's a really, it's an open door is what you're saying, but it, but it hasn't moved on as far as I can judge, or the, my sort of, uh, sort of thick, so sifting around information. Right. Am I right? You're right. The protect yeah. suicide strategy is exactly the same, same way. Yeah. It has sat now for four years waiting to actually, we are still working on the old strategy and it's, the new it's one has been really updated and it's ready to go. So, so that, I'm really, uh, yeah. what date, yeah. sorry to, to get back to uh, What date that, is that letter? <laughs> first of April, uh, two so, weeks ago. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, maybe make an appointment to see him. I think so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the legislation, the amazing thing is that the legislation is sitting there, yes. silent. Yes. 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 But it also has to be done the right way. I mean, yes. we're looking at the new anti-bullying policy that every school is required to introduce. Do you know the level of bureaucracy that's adding to every member of staff dealing with a bullying incident is, is criminal. So there's a right way to do this and there's a wrong way to do this. We need to make sure it's done the right way. Any more questions, anyone? Well, can I, well, I, that, that was just me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I come to this looking at it, but in two ways. When, when uh, from the point of view of education intervention, school-based, curriculum-based, and yeah. more generally, because I've been involved over the years with a few, not not on the emotional regulation side, but on other kinds of things. And I suppose I learned a whole lot of things 
that that had to do with wrong. Do you know what I mean? And I, I was involved in things that didn't work or that didn't yeah. work. And the two th and, and two things I struck me really, really powerfully about this piece of work, uh, which I'm really impressed with, I'm really inspired, I have to say, and uh, I say that before I, I get on to more technical things I'm going to say next, is 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 getting the program right. You know, and you you have the lesson for that, and you have we're getting the implementation of the program right, and as well as I was struck by your your in your pilot actually doing some sort of a process analysis of not just how the children are receiving it, yeah. but how well the deliverers are. Yeah. What are the barriers? How difficult is it to get yes. into schools? I mean, these are all enthusiasts. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If you go to scale with anything, you're going into every school. Yeah. Uh, and so what are the what are the likely barriers yes. of finding a place, the right place, and as you say, for the different ages? The other thing that struck me was the pedagogy, as well as having the content of the program, it is how are you going to teach it. But your claim is that hope is a teaching. So what's going to be the pedagogical approach? I began to see, even just through your examples, the tools and the visualizations, and there was a lot of things there that showed me, in a sense, indirectly at least, what tools. But I've seen things sort of go down the spout because the content was very good, but the actual how it was taught yeah. was that that wasn't given. They're kind of two separate. Yeah. You know what you want to, to teach, but it's getting how to teach that yes. in a way that achieves your. So I just say, I well, could speak for a long yeah. time. I'm fascinated with the I think we could probably all, we could all comment on that you know, a little bit. Yeah. And it was something came up yesterday. We were doing focus groups interviews in Oak Grove College yesterday. And I asked the question to the facilitators and to the principal of the school. I asked the question themselves, you know, uh, because we wanted to find out. Because, you know, Catherine will explain to you, she wants this to be able to be picked up globally and taught you know in the exact same replica way that's important you know that it has to be replicated but we are also kind of interested in what if you're a very stressed teacher and you're kind of coming from a point of being burnt out you don't have much hope yourself how do you instill this in other people how do you take this curriculum and deliver it you know if there's a lot of stress barriers we talked about that a little bit but we also talked about the you know what's what what's needed can you take this you know, from the website and deliver it. And I suppose the answer really was, well, look, if you're bought into it, yes, you, you could do it. But a lot of the time, you need that you need the buy-in. You need to be uh, the passion needs to be installed within you. You know, you need to understand that. You need to uh, appreciate. You know, um, what it's about and what it's what it's trying to do. Um, and you'd hope that that's possible through 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 that. Now everybody can have a look at the website, it's www.hopefulminds.org. The 12 lessons are all there. But Mary, this is where Mary has come in because she has demonstrated and explained well just her experience of teaching uh, the you know delivering two-day training you know to facilitators, their buy into it, but also how it, it impacted them themselves. Maybe you want to I think the nicest thing is because we're we're looking at, at, at raising trauma awareness, a trauma awareness in schools and trauma awareness in workplaces. And when you go in, you say we're going to talk about trauma awareness. It's actually terrifies people. But if you can go in with a kind of a natural process, when when we're delivering this, we subtly kind of spoon feed and drip feed trauma awareness. For example, we say to teachers, you know, if you're delivering the program, it's how it's delivered. You know, even the simple language of, you know, if something goes wrong, don't be saying, I'm kind of changing your language. What's wrong? What's happened? And also, if you're doing group work with children, you're doing mindfulness, because mindfulness has started to slip into our schools, very, and there's a lot of people delivering it, and it's not safe. Because what we would say is, you know, if you're telling a child to close their eyes when they're doing a mindfulness, you can actually traumatize a child that has already experienced because the last time they've closed their eyes, maybe when they sat at breakfast in the morning and they went for the slam or they went for the row to break down at home so they can open their eyes and come out of it. So if you're doing mindfulness, we will never say close your eyes. We will invite children. So the language you're using is always an invitation. If you feel safe and you want to close your eyes, if not, pick a little space where you can do it and we'll do some mindfulness. And you'll find children who've experienced trauma <coughs> or are actually kind of insecure will actually go into a little corner, they'll take off their jacket 
and they'll cover their legs and they'll sit down on the floor and they'll do the mindfulness in their safe space. But what you're doing through Hope for Minds, you're saying, that's okay to do that. That's your safe space. And then their children are learning to emotionally regulate through their own trauma without bringing the spotlight straight on them. You're doing it in a natural way. So we're teaching and facilitating to understand that when you're delivering the Hope for Minds, it has to be done safely. So, and understanding that, and understanding your own well-being. If I don't have hope when I'm having a bad day, I can't instill hope in somebody else. I need to step back and kind of work on it myself to do it. And that's the nice stuff. And, and I'm not teaching people it, we facilitate it. It's a little bit of a difference because when you get people in to facilitate, they're actually working on a journey. You're waltzing, you're not trying to pump knowledge in, you're bringing it out. And that's the difference in the hope for minds. And when we bring people together, and it's lovely when you bring academic people who are teachers who are very equipped in the knowledge, while you bring a parent that just wants to sit and make buns and kind of do it this way, you're actually doing different types of learning and learning styles, and everybody is building hope together. And that's what we're finding with the programme. And I'm just, every time we do the two days training, we go away and the things we hear. We had one teacher come last week to the program in the Southern Trust and he said he'd been he'd been on a training program. He says, I don't know how many I've been on and I've never gone away with such a mindset of change. He says, I'm going home and I'm going to teach hope in our school from now on. And he says, you know, I, I'll never be inspired like this before. But people inspire each other because they share a little piece of themselves and they actually bring hope. So the training, if anybody wants to come on it, we will be starting to delivered again in each of the areas and trying to get it going, but we want to, to make this grow. And I just think by bringing people together for the training, you're creating a network and you're creating family and then people start supporting each other. So that's that's the reason why we've done this for you. Okay. Thank you. Catherine just wants to Yeah, and just, just to add to that, I mean, it, the research said hope was teachable, but nobody had come up with an operational way to do that. And so that's what we attempted to do. And we focused on a very specific age range and took the skills that you need to have a hopeful mindset and we created ways to you know teach that or in encourage kids to learn of that and so and so we wanted to iterate on that and first learn is this teaching them hope i mean it was everyone's best guess as to what we could do to instill this and so the goal is really to gather the evidence around that specific age group and then take and build on this what the skills are and how to do that, and then integrate it into very innovative ways of learning. So through video games or through Lego construction or in churches or you know youth groups or really figure out how can we, because it is a big challenge to get into the school system and into the curriculum. And he is rare, <laughs> you know? This is amazing and, and Yet we know that anxiety and depression are youth are our biggest challenges in, in schools. So, you know, to, to kind of transform how education works, it's been a big challenge in the US, but we plan to be very innovative in how we implement it. Really how whatever kid if they're reading, you know, instill these concepts into what they're reading. Um, but it's still kind of an exploratory process as we gather evidence and improve and iterate and yeah. It, who knows how it will. Hopefully in a big concert with Bruce Springsteen <laughs> and all the celebrities. That's our big hope. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Any more questions, anyone? Okay. Okay, we'll close the symposium. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.